happy to collaborate with you as well. We certainly, you know, share the theme of self-liberation, which, you know, at least to me seems ultimately what this journey kind of is about to um, allow ourselves to believe for a brief moment in the eyes of the one creator that, you know, we are limited, we are, you know, maybe even slaves of all of this and then discover all, all the systems, all the structures and ultimately pierce through the illusion of those contrived, artificially self-limiting perceptions and belief systems. Maybe one last thing I could mention, mm -hmm. one last useful tool that I always like to apply is when hearing anything, you know, anything is just a proposition of a belief system you can adopt or not. But if in any way, shape or form, anyone is ever commuting, communicating anything to you and you feel that it is limiting, you feel it's off, you feel it's, uh, it's feeling bad. And here again, I'm not talking about ignoring something you should transform, but I'm basically talking about um, any type of belief or proposition that would make you believe that you are, let's say, more limited than you feel yourself, less capable, less powerful, less divine, less infinite, uh, less choice or whatever. Uh, and one can always feel that, you know, it feels kind of strange, you know, it's not appropriate. And what I had come to discover is that those negative belief systems, all of them, they are fundamentally always wrong. Just as they say with fear, it's nothing but false evidence appearing real. And anytime one is in those states, one cannot see it, which is, you know, the great illusion of this place that we have built within our own consciousness that we can can actually in a way pretend to really believe it yeah mm -hmm. but ultimately one can always discover that all negative belief systems that are triggering your scarcity response and your fight or flight response your fear of your own existence your fear of your own worthiness they're always wrong and if we have the courage to investigate them we will always discover that they are wrong and this is also how we can liberate ourselves individually and collectively yes. all right and welcome to the bonnie podcast the podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the servile society i'm your host shane coming to you from the free republic of pasnia uh, the self-liberators paradise uh, please do check out the website pasnia p-a-z-n-i-a.com uh, if you'd like to learn more about the second realm network that we're building and uh, if you'd like to get involved in our seed exchange the pasnia community of correspondence community chat uh, or if you're interested in becoming a bigger part in what we're building by becoming a stakeholder uh, yeah, again, just visit the website pasnia.com. Uh, you can also find the 2021-2022 Pasnia Stakeholder Bulletin linked uh, at the very top of the website. That'll go, uh, you know, pretty in depth on on uh, what's what's uh, what's taking place. But uh, anyway, yesterday Sunday, I released a discussion I had over on the uh, Team Rabbit Hole podcast uh, this past week with hosts Raphael and Jim. Uh, well, today I am pleased to welcome Raphael uh, to the Vani podcast. Uh, I'll have him provide a more thorough uh, introduction and background, but uh, I figure we'll get into uh, spiritual self liberation topics from his perspective, uh, the role of psychedelics in his journey, and uh, maybe even some false timeline uh, historical reset stuff, uh, since he has some firsthand, very personal experiences. And you kind of got a little taste of that at the end of uh, that episode. But uh, um, yeah, I think we might go just a touch further into it. It's a it's a pretty massive topic, and I mean uh, I put a lot of hours into it, and I don't I don't really know if I know much more than it did, did uh, you know it's starting out. But um, anyway, uh, well I guess we'll do the rest of uh, the rest of the discussion uh, open to whatever whatever transpires. Uh, but anyway, uh, Raphael, welcome to the Va uh, welcome to the uh, Vani podcast, my friend. Uh, how are things going in Austria? Thank you very much. Well, I'm doing well. You know, uh, oftentimes people, at least in German. They oftentimes say how people are being asked, how are you doing? And then people answer, well, according to circumstance, you know, and then I'm always like, well, that's the one thing you don't want to be doing, you know, not according to circumstance. Um, but yeah, I would say everything is good, even, you know, with the whole uh, scandemic, uh, as you may be able to tell probably anywhere by now, it seems to be running out of fuel, but, you know, f new fear mongering ammunition already has been loaded and is, you know, firing from all the batteries, you know, so, but I'm doing fine. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Well, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's good to hear. That's uh, definitely good to hear. So I guess, uh, um, and, uh, you know, as, as kind of, uh, Jim says over on team rabbit hole, feel free to go, you know, as in depth or as, you know, as a uh, more of an overview as you'd like, but, uh, I guess, tell us a bit about, uh, your path here, uh, you know, your upbringing, upbringing, where you grew up, 
uh, influences on on uh, your path to spiritual self liberation, uh, whatever you think is uh, relevant and uh, would like to share. All right, yeah. So I was born and raised in Vienna, and well, where to start and where to stop? I would say, in terms of um, the actual path of self discovery or even just being critical of the system, let's say, uh, the moments I distinctively remember, and this is, of course, just, you know, somehow of a random uh, recollection of differing threshold moments that I would now identify from this present moment in terms of the past. It's, of course, in a sense, arbitrary. You know, everything is a grand process. But just to, you know, some of the things I remember distinctively, for example, I think, like, you know, as a teenager, maybe 11, 12 years old, very simple thing, you know, watching the news, local state news or whatever in Austria, and same story always goes, you know, story number one, oh, there's a big war or something, we're going to send all the help or, I mean, Austria usually doesn't send ammunition, but, you know, we send medics or whatever, there's plenty of money for that, you know. And then next news item, oh, there's all these poor people or whatever, all this misery in Austria even or something. And yeah, it's so bad. We don't have enough money for this. Something along those lines, you know, just a very basic realization that there's something wrong with the budgeting, you know, there's some some issue with the priorities and uh, even with how it's being presented and uh, what is being focused on and what is not. And then... Um, very simple i believe i was uh, 15 and i had just got interested actually in let's just say alternate systems of governance mm -hmm. and at that point it was 2005 uh, george bush jr got re-elected and um, even though in retrospect one may even say even more things about the different presidents and what is good or very bad about them but at least in europe um bush had a very bad reputation and he really came across like a bumbling idiot if he really is i don't know apparently he's painting or something but at least here then it was like okay well if this kind of guy can get elected two times or put into that position and he even in terms of public persona appears to be an idiot or something and warmongering obviously that was the point for me when I was like, okay, now I am completely putting any and all trust I have in this supposed system of democracy or whatever on hold. Because if something like this happened that the supposed, you know, most important individual on the planet, most powerful, can be someone like this, start a huge war and get reelected, you know, the system is broken, obviously, right? Mm -hmm. So um, that was one other demarcation line for me. And that was also the time just even maybe on that day of the re-election, I don't know, again, I was looking online for like alternate systems of governance because in school, at least here, you're only being taught about capitalism. You're not really being taught about it, but as you know, somehow abstract mm -hmm. and about communism. Both seem to be very inefficient systems that bring a lot of misery. Um, and during that point, at that time, actually, I discovered about technocracy which interestingly enough is a system developed in the officially at least 1920s 1930s in north america through the so-called technical alliance mm -hmm. um they eventually got stopped but the interesting thing is that in a new uh, form let's say a bureaucratic monster form this has come back through the european union and actually through all kinds of round table groups and uh, you know, more or less secret society groups, because basically what they want to do, even to this day, is to create, you know, a rule by expert, so that even the last remnants or something of democracy, which could lead to some kind of a populist driven decision, should also be dismantled and disarmed in a sense, to ensure that there would only be, you know, a top down rule, where Ideally, the question of self-determination is not even brought up anymore because authority and decision-making power by default is being given to others, right? <laughs> Makes sense? <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
No, I'm I'm with you. So, the, and the interest, yes. Yeah, so, um, the interesting thing was just that at that point, so 2005 or something, I learned about technocracy and the old system because at that point it wasn't yet in you know, the modern version hadn't arrived fully yet, at least not with that term. Um, and technocracy in its original form or how it was devised most likely always was, you know, a device for even more control than even the fake democracies we have. However, it still contains some interesting elements, at least or thought experiments that were not existing in the present capitalist system or communist system for that matter at all. So at least it had some interesting aspects. I also had read at that point, um, Thorstein Veblen, mm -hmm. The Theory of the Leisure Class, quite an interesting book, which is about conspicuous mm -hmm. consumption and vicarious consumption and stuff like this, kind of trying to explain the materialist side of why capitalism and consuming and so on, even, you know, can hold any sway of a population or how the psychological dynamics work. Mm. Ultimately, um, it just allowed me to see at least that there is at least one, you know, differing system in terms of technocracy. Then for some time, I was pretty interested in that and was researching a lot about it, you know, telling friends about it and so on. Until then, not too long after, there was a small European group, just a few guys in Europe, and they said, okay, we really like the system, but we would like to develop it further. And what they basically did, and I kind of joined them for some time, at least in discussions and so on, um, was to integrate the idea of, I almost want to say, well, we called it a uh, holarchy or holons. So the idea of having a fractal system of organization. So basically combine the idea of an expert driven system with the idea of a distributed system, because of course, having it highly centralized, even all of us, we could see, you know, that's that's unsustainable, right? So this was maybe the first foray into, you know, exploring different systems, thinking about them in different ways. And then it was maybe somewhat similar as to what you described. In my case, it was when I was, I believe, about 22. And uh, I had never really perused, this is where we can already, if you want, switch into the psychedelics, never really perused any substances. I maybe drank a little bit and really just, you know, try to see what it does two, three times, which where I realized it's not the substance of choice for me because it's too heavy on the body and it's, you know, just not resonant with my frequency. Mm -hmm. And a friend came around with um, some weed <laughs> and we tried it a few times. And this was basically when I would say I had one of my, if not the very first, very conscious, very strong, quote unquote, awakening experiences. Um, yeah, I'll let you ask any questions and then I'll go on. Yeah, yeah, no, that's uh, that's that's really interesting. I guess the first thing um, there was one one thing you said earlier, and it was it was definitely um, you know it definitely related uh, it definitely resonated with me in that um, I know like early on like when I just started becoming like looking into like paying attention I guess is the way that I'll that I'll put it. Um, <clears throat> it took like one election cycle and then this, the next election cycle at the start to realize that like every two or four years people are having the same discussions they're having the same debates and um to kind of go out more macro with it um it was like uh seeing seeing the the very small cycle within the small cycle and um i don't know like you can kind of see the script play over again uh in real time and it, it only it didn't take long for me to kind of to see that because you had like um, I because whenever the you know the, the fake pandemic came around again before I even knew about kind of the David Crow infectious myth stuff, um, it was like, oh like every four every three or four years or every single year they you know there's they they say that something's gonna kill us all so like, how are you guys falling for this shit again? Um, so it kind of seems like you had a very early recognition on like with the with the political system like okay if this is happening again like something's got to be really really wrong, um, <laughs> with 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 the way things are. And of course, I, I cannot forget, uh, in this case, 9-11, of course, um, I guess I was 11 or 12 years old. And that's also, of course, you know, a big, I guess, shock or something, if at least to some extent, you know, you're in a somewhat middle class family or something, everything is at least somewhat all right, even if your parents got divorced or business goes to S or something. But in you know, overall, it's the structure seems to be somewhat working, you know. But then if, you know, supposedly, you know, two planes 
crash into the most secured building of the most secure country in the world, obviously something's not right, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so of course that also helped, greatly helped. And from that point of view, even I guess America or American politics, even in a sense, even back then actually greatly helped me to wake up because it was even more obvious can I swear on this? I don't explicitly want to swear, but yes, I'm thinking of shit show, you know, yeah, 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 even do. a more, even a more obvious, you know, I don't do it gratuitously, but in this case, I think it was yeah. even more uh, of a shit show, even more conceited and even more blatantly warmongering and anti-human, let's say, um, is a reflection I could gain from American politics simply because, you know, you have one of the biggest, you know, police type army, you know, positions and so on in Austria, not that it would not be equally corrupt ultimately, it's just that, you know, we are not the ones to be declaring war or something on the world stage. So from that point of view, whatever happened in America, both with 9-11 and with George Bush obviously being a warmongering crazy and lying, you know, really helped me to wake up even more strongly to be like, okay, if in the biggest, most important constitutional republic, actually not democracy, right, Mm -hmm. things are going like this, then, you know, there's something so fundamentally wrong. The system cannot be trusted and the controls implemented in the system obviously aren't working. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's of course, very important. I think to, um, forego, which many people have is this probably not on your podcast to listeners, but many people, this very, um, ingrained default trust, you know, as if the state is your daddy and the church is your mommy or something, Right. but you know, (laughs) Turns out they're not the best parents, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's that's true, and it, it brings to mind. Um, and I, I mean, like, uh, it's it's really just the, um, you know, uh, you know, two thousand one happened, and public indoctrination had been there for a long time. Um, and a lot of the, yeah, like I said in, in the team rabbit hole discussion, a lot of this mind control stuff had been there for a while. But like I remember, and I I didn't I didn't look into nine eleven until I was like eighteen or nineteen. So like it wasn't it was it was past it where it wasn't really relevant anymore. But I remember listening to Bill Cooper, um, and this was like in the June twenty eighth two thousand one where he where he you know did the whatever they're gonna blame on Bin Laden. Don't you even believe it? It was hilarious. He was talking about some jackass camera crew from CNN went and had an interview a TV interview with Bin Laden in his secret hideout, um, but. Um, you know, the biggest intelligence agency in the entire world with the most funding couldn't, didn't know where he was. Um, so like you look like even before, like, um, <clears throat> yeah, ev- even before then, I mean, there, the, there really wasn't any questioning or like, it was just complete lack of, what, lack of common sense. Or as you were saying, maybe it was just, you know, um, maybe it was just the, you know, that, that very fallacious and naive belief, um, dangerous belief in this world that like people, people don't do things, do these bad things to each other. If they tell you, if they tell you this and it's gotta be the truth, cause why would they, why would they, right? Um, I wouldn't do that to somebody. Why, why would they, you know? Yes, exactly. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Interesting. So, yeah. So ahead. maybe. Yeah, please, please go ahead. Yes, go ahead. If you have any any further questions, and then I'll go on with you know whatever happened from the psychedelics point yep. forward. Yeah, you know? But if you have any more questions yep. about, yep, that's what I was going to say. We can, if you want to get back to your your story, and we can get kind of into the psychedelics discussion. Yeah, that works. All right. Um, we can also, of course, go back to anything. You know, just to have very brief outline, very simple one. Mm-hmm. Actually, if you link my website, there is um, under log. If people manage to go to like really the back pages, there's like at least. I think five or six essays, kind of long form, and also with plenty of sources, um, where I try to, in a somewhat relatable way, both uh, relay my personal experiences and also related to some, let's say, aspects of philosophy, psychology, different teachers and documentaries I was aware of at that time. Mm -hmm. And these are things I actually started writing after I had this experience. in 2012, let's say. Um, And what had happened, I'm going to explain it very briefly. It's recounted in the essay called uh, A Shift in Perception. Mm -hmm. Um, Basically, what happened is for whatever reason, you know, because the quality of this was good, I was the right state of mind. I believe I even had just started experimenting with eating vegetarian, actually, Mm -hmm. which may have assisted or not, you know. Um, but certainly there have been, had been quite a few years where already I was, let's say, very actively searching for 
uh, truth, quote unquote. And my actual question for quite some time at that point already was, where is authority coming from? This was actually my question. So where can authority, true authority be found? And generally one would say, oh, with this and that institution and with this state power or with this army or this secret society or something like that. But then of course, eventually you realize that uh, all real authority only comes from yourself. And uh, as I believe, you know, I had this question, I was, you know, hushed along that path in a sense also <clears throat> in a psychedelic way. So it's similar to what you had described on the podcast in terms of potentially having a slight imbalance into the analytical focus, um, mm -hmm. left side brain in a sense. Yeah. Um, and we basically allowing me to shift into a state of relaxation and somewhat adjusting my frequency to simply allow, as I would say, you know, some communication with my higher self, some realizations to come in. The experience itself was interesting because I felt as if I'm sitting or standing, but as if my astral body would attempt to um, materialize itself slightly next to me, let's say, or with a, if it were a camera, like I'm looking like this and I felt as if my astral body was actually a few centimeters or a few degrees off. And whether this is a real thing or not, I can't tell you. But all I know is the um, experience of that was very strong with open eyes. And I also had some, you know, some ideas, some quote unquote visions coming in, if you will, just some, I would say, basic understanding about how reality actually functions. The main point here being, I'm not sure if I had mentioned this on the podcast, but basically seeing different frames and realizing that, um, Everything in this world is based on definition, of course, based on limitation, limitation in order to have a particularized experience. However, our actual uh, core being, our actual self exists beyond time and space mm -hmm. and also beyond any definition. This is what one then could call, call God, universe, the one creator or the higher self over soul aspect at the highest level. And what I basically saw is that, or felt is that I, and we all are existing in this realm beyond and in each and every now are defining ourselves to be existing in this realm simultaneously in a sense. And in order to exist here, what we are doing, and this was the visual representation is we are going through all of these frames of definition to arrive <clears throat> in this very limited or very particular point of view that we have as a human. And how this goes then in this vision was simply, you're basically imagine you are all that is in a sense, or you could imagine yourself sitting in an infinite void, <clears throat> unity, consciousness. And, and from there on, what you do is you enter a frame and that frame simply says, you could imagine like a golden frame, you know, and it says, you know, dimension one or something. That's one particular dimension, one particular universe. You enter that, then you have a next frame and it would say, for example, humanoid. You enter the humanoid frame. And in the next frame, already here, you could have different races, for example, if one believes in etheric races, and one of them would be Homo sapiens. You enter that. Then you enter a particular culture, or you say Earth, you know, you have all these definitions until you arrive at your personality. And all of these are, you know, infinite frames stacked <clears throat> behind each other. And they all lead you towards, let's say, down this path of actually being able to have a particularized, individualized experience as a human body on this particular plane. And the joke is that while you exist back there, you are simultaneously manifesting yourself here. And you're actually, in a sense, going back and forth all the time or switching on and off, there's kind of a flicker rate of reality it seems, which I later learned through Bashar. He says something along the lines of, I don't know, like 3 billion times per second, you're actually manifesting and dematerializing yourself in this reality. There appears to be some uh, ideas and research about this in terms of quantum science. I believe this is related with what they call Planck time. 
Um, mm. Anyhow, so this was somewhat of a glimpse of that principle. And overall, what this experience just did is that while I had already been reading about philosophy and religion and so on, in this particular moment, I said to myself, okay, either I'm going completely insane, you know, drug induced trauma or um, psychosis or something, you know, hmm. or I can just take whatever I'm experiencing right now at full value, just see it for what it is, keep trusting my own perception, which is what I chose. However, at the same time, moment then if I'm experiencing all these things both in terms of my apparent visual perception and also the insights I seem to be getting in this particular first conscious awakening experience simply smoking weed with some friends you know um, <clears throat> if I do go along with this perception it simply means that I need to change my frame of reference according basically to some of the things I had read about spirituality and religion so basically, in this moment, I realized, oh, these interesting things I was reading about, they are not just nice ideas, but now I had the first glimpse of actually having a direct experience of those ideas. So basically, I saw time and space being shattered with like some kind of a hammer in front of my astral vision, you know, interesting mm, stuff like that. Yeah. Interesting. So that was just from just from cannabis. Then you you weren't you did you it, it didn't it didn't take you know like LSD or ayahuasca or anything anything I guess more quote unquote. Hmm. That's no, it didn't take anything more. And um, I'm putting it in this frame because on the one hand, I would say maybe I was somewhat similar to you in having quite a analytical mind and going about it in this way. And also, I was quite stressed at that point because I did not know quote unquote, that my existence is infinite. And uh, if you really believe you're human limited by this lifetime, at least to me, that was pretty stressful. And I felt that something's really not right. And I need to find some kind of a way, basically, to become immortal. I'm not joking now. Um, and then I, you know, was receiving the boon of a great insight and relaxation through that experience. Because through this, I realized, oh, I'm already immortal. Good. You know, it's just kind of a game. And, um, but it also explains many of the people here running around with the, as if their heads are cut off or something or doing all kinds of crazy stuff to live longer or to try to achieve immortality. You know, the technocracy prophet Ray Kurzweil, of course, is at the forefront of this. And this can be much more easily understood if one gets the idea that most of those individuals are strong atheists and they don't mm -hmm. properly even seem to understand, I don't know, basic energy physics or basic quantum science. And that's mm -hmm. why they're so scared. And that's why they do all that stuff. It's really understandable. It also helped me a lot because I was like, in a way, I was in that position. You know, I didn't do anything crazy, but I felt the stress of like, something's wrong. I'm not, I, I believe I'm not infinite. This has to be fixed until I realized mm -hmm. it's only my own misconception, misunderstanding, which created that stress, you know? Yeah. And I, I can definitely relate to that. Um, I can, I can definitely relate to that. I've, I've recounted my health issues on this podcast a number of times, basically the chronic poisoning from Babylon pharmaceuticals, but, um, not to get into that, but like I, so it was, I guess it was a few years ago. Like I'd, I'd, I'd made my, you know, way of eating change. I felt a lot better. I'd lost like 15 or 20 pounds within the span of like six months. I was ex just extremely healthy, doing extremely well. And this is the last time I ever trusted ever, ever, you know, um, really took the inside of, uh, like a, a, a quack doctor seriously. I'll put it that way. Um, but I, I, I went in there for the blood tests and my LDL cholesterol was like just a touch high and it makes sense. Like for, for type one diabetics with chronically high blood sugars, that's normal. That's not abnormal at all. But I went in there after that and had gone up like 20 points. And she's like, Oh my gosh, I got to put you on a statin. And, uh, I was like, you know, like <laughs> they don't take you off those. I don't think. So I, I, I was, uh, I, she, she wrote the prescription for it, but I, um, I basically, I, I, um, you know, I, I was like, you know, I'll do one, I'll just, I'll spend like one day. Like, I don't have to make a decision right now. I'll spend one day. And that was like the first, like the first real dive into like a, a specific subsect of, of, of the medical field. But anyway, like the, but immediately after that, 
um, like a, a she like a, um, as is typically the case when you get like I've heard like with cancer diagnoses like that can cause cancer itself just the cancer diagnosis like just the physical physiological change from the trauma of that experience so oh, like yeah. I had I so I I, I, <laughs> exactly, I, I yeah. kind of I was starting to feel things and I was like like I, I kind of got scared at like for a couple for a couple couple days until I sorted myself out but I, like that's that's one of the the big reasons too is like um, and I think that's that's typical for. It's not that's not abnormal for this for this sort of path anyway is like um, death like I need to I need to learn about death and I need to yeah, like you said kind of overcome death per se um, and then yeah it's definitely radically changed since then when you have that more of a macro perspective but I can definitely definitely relate um, to, to to I guess that that uh, that impact yeah interesting yeah um so this was basically, you know, this one experience, like I said, some of it and some of what came of it is recounted in these essays, because also at that point, maybe this could be interesting to share. I was still, I was, was I still working? Yeah. I actually had one of the few, or maybe the only somewhat corporate job I ever had in a, as a freelancer for a startup hmm. and, uh, you know, very nice. They give you all the amenities and so on, and they cook food for you, and they pay you pretty well and so on. But still, if it's some still some boring IT support work, or you know, in this case, was a cloud-based service, not open source. You know, if you have some principles, you know, already there's plenty of reasons why I won't be like, ah, uh, you know, not sure if this is what I really want to support. And um, actually, just just about when I had started there, I had this experience, I think, more or less. So I only stayed there for like half a year. And during that time, I also started writing those essays. And then eventually I said, okay, I was also studying. I had just more or less finished my bachelor's and started with a master's degree in systems theory, actually, mm -hmm. at a um, distance learning university called Open University in UK which was somewhat decent, at least compared to what you can learn at local universities, because, you know, you don't need to go there every day. It's basically, at least to me, it seemed like less slaving away. And I was really surprised why most people after high school were immediately, you know, looking for the next best thing to again, fill their calendar with 40 plus hours mm -hmm. a week, you know, and I wasn't really looking to do that. At least I was trying, looking to be more efficient. Um, anyhow, so, what basically happened is after this experience, I wrote these essays and then I said, okay, if all of this is kind of true, then it has to be even more simple because I had read different books and started making like a framework of reality for myself. Like how does this actually function? How does reality truly work? And how is experience really created and modeled and interpreted? And how is my life in a sense created by myself? And uh, after doing some of that, I believe it was February 2013 or something, or January, I stumbled, uh, or even, it's a good question, what it was, no, it was 13, yeah. I stumbled across um, Bashar, whom I had mentioned last time, this channel, and all that this really did for me, there was even an old website back then, which is very basic principles, and he talks about universal law. At that point, he was talking about four. Initially, I think there were two, then three, four, now there's five but they still basically all say the same or try to define the same basic idea. So I'll see if I can give the rundown right now. Number one is you exist. Number two is what you put out is what you get back. Number three is the one is all, the all are one. Number four is everything is here and now. And number five is everything changes except those four first laws and um, this in association with some simple understanding that your belief systems basically are the template for your reality your emotions are the you know energy that's fueling it and your actions are the the workers you know that get the belief system built and manifested into your reality that's like you know in a nutshell bashar and when i learned about it and was like, oh, it can be so simple. And apparently there's a whole, you know, lore about this. And all you ultimately have to do that I'm already done with Bashar is um, in every moment that you can follow whatever excites you the most with integrity, meaning discerning between 
having a fear-based response and actual, you know, unconditional love-based inspiration to act towards an idea. Take it as far as you can without any expectation or insistence on a particularized outcome. Mm -hmm. And then in the next moment, do it again. And keep doing it because following your exciting following your excitement ultimately can be both the driving engine and the organizing principle of your life and it will always at the very least support you with anything and everything you could possibly need in order to continue following your highest excitement and then and then it is espoused that you know this is not a nice theory but this is actual metaphysical principle and if it is applied it pretty much always works so I was like, hmm, that sounds interesting. I'll try that. Mm -hmm. And what can I say? Many years later, I'm still alive. And I rarely did anything ever in these many years that I didn't really want to do. So that's a win for me, let's say, <laughs> in my book, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, I've, I've just, I've just kind of gotten there in the past few years. Um, that's why, you know, I call these, I call it a liberated lifestyle where your time is your own. And you can, be, yeah, you, you do like a... Um, you do what you're inspired to, and and you made a good point. I did. I didn't realize this, but like the it, just like everything else in the survival society, like the eight hour eight hour workday is such a scam. Like all you need is like three or four like really good committed hours, and like you can equal or exceed, um, like easily, easily. So that, that's a, that's a good point, and it's not something I really thought about um, very much until recently. Yes, and even here, you know, the big joke is maybe in. America, it's similar, but in Austria, they always make jokes about people that are civil servants, for example. You know, they always joke around like, oh, you're a civil servant, you know, maybe you work an hour in the morning, then you drink coffee, you know, and then, you know, nothing's happening. And, or even just from a, let's say, energy point of view, how many individuals can really work in a focused and effective sense for more than maybe four to maybe six hours a day, unless they have a really menial, you know, dumb down job where they just, you know, stand somewhere as a security mm -hmm. or something, or they have a job where they're so engaged, like for example, in, um, in service or in, you know, uh, wait, being a waiter or a cook or something where you're just so kept on edge, you just have to keep working or you're an investment banker. But as we understand, even they, maybe they work 12 hours, but don't want to know their monthly cocaine consumption on average, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's just to me at least pretty obvious that this eight hour is like a scam, you know, mm -hmm. and like it's uh, from many points of view, because on the one hand, it's a scam because it's, uh, it's especially now it's not even supporting you anymore. You know, when the American right. dream started, maybe 50 years ago, a single father could, you know, support a family with three children or something. This has changed a lot. I'm not sure how much you know about the whole uh, Aaron Rousseau, I think it was Aaron Russo, this documentary filmmaker. And he oh, once yeah. said, yeah, he talked to some kind of Rockefeller guy and they spoke about feminism. And Aaron Russo was kind of like a yeah, feminism. It's a cool thing, no, like equal rights for women, right? That's cool. And this, I think Rockefeller guy was laughing at him and was like, yeah, sure. As if that was the reason why we did that, you know, it's simply like this, we have, you know, more taxable income and we can have more control over the population if there is not, not even a mother anymore to properly raise their children. And I'm not even going to get into mandatory sentencing for, you know, having whatever you would call it, an ounce of weed or something, and you're in the wrong neighborhood, maybe you're even black, you get put away for three years, like, you know, starting a great cycle while at the same time, you know, the CIA is importing the drugs you know, mm -hmm. to fund some kind of a deep state war in South America. You know, just one example. Um, yeah, it's an, it's an absolute scam, both in terms of that it is suggested that this would be support you or make you happy, but it's also a scam in the other point of view that even here, it's not even about effective or efficient work. Because like I said, who can really sustain eight hours of real output? Mm -hmm. Very few people, I would say, can. Um, so even here, it's a scam. I would say that many people then, you know, kind of pretend to be working or you're there. But if you can, you try to slack if it's not something you really like doing or even just because it's too stressful or too much. Mm -hmm. So um, it reminded me of like being in school or something where there you could also say, oh, no, but today I'm sick, you know. Mm -hmm. And if you if you get your mother to sign it or if you get your doctor to sign it, then it's okay. 
yeah even if you're hanging out with your friends so it's like all like scamming each other all the time you know and i was like this is such a bad model whether i'm an employee or whether i'm an employer if this is the basis basis of the model it's just everyone if they don't really like what they're doing anyhow is always only looking for the way out or in a sense how to scam or deceive or trick the other to you know just not even not to burn out you know yeah I'll pretend I'm sick, you know, I stay off a week. It's very common, I guess, at least here. Maybe it's a bit different in America, but here it's very common that, and yeah, I'm not even blaming anyone for it, but it just makes it obvious that this is a very bad system um, for everyone. <laughs> and yeah, very but, ineffective. Yeah, ineffective. Yeah. yeah, well, it's it's, it's got to be that way, though, because I, I know, um, you know, as of years ago, and, you know, I kind of I kind of envision this, like uh, one of the perks, you know, getting to, to Vani, one of the one of the lifestyle changes is van nomadism. And the thinking behind it is that if you can, um, most people's, you know, biggest expense is a mortgage or rent or something along those lines. So if you cut out that biggest expense, you have a lot more time to yourself to think or read or whatever the hell you want to do with your time. <clears throat> but um, obviously, like, I, I think it's it's not even about um, and I, yeah, I, 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 I would would assume you'd be agree, you would agree with this, but it's not about it's obviously not about efficiency or um, the economics because like it's especially thinking about the you know the the fake stimulus money that went out over the past couple of years like um, <clears throat> I mean money's not an issue right um, and serving you know it's and, not and, about and keeping... productivity mm -hmm. it's about control yeah. yep exactly exactly so um, yeah it's I mean it, it's got to be this way and because um, you uh, yeah like you said the pe people can't. Yeah, the, the eight hours and it, it wears people down. They can't do it. So as you're saying with the investment bankers, they need cocaine. Um, I needed alcohol to make it through. You know, to, to to be able to be able to make it through the shit. And um, I mean, uh, I didn't um, I didn't have the bandwidth to, to like I I was obviously getting into anarchism and doing you know radio and stuff, but um, definitely not to the extent that I could have obviously. So um, it definitely definitely restricted my bandwidth. Um, and. <clears throat> Yeah, it's it makes sense why it's like that, right? It definitely makes sense. It has to be that way. Exactly, yes. You know, it has to keep you distracted. And, you know, we could go back even how the system has to make you feel unworthy and so on, proving your worth. You know, your mommy and your daddy didn't like you or whatever issue you had with them or whatever imagined issue, you know, whatever trauma there may have been. It gets superimposed onto the church and the state. And now you're bound to please them. And then this gets, you know, abstracted even further into ideas such as money, you know, and all, all the nice illusions we have just in an attempt to become accepted by your imagined parents. You know, that's one of the models. I'm not saying everyone has this issue, but oftentimes it's something related with that. And the, the, the control structure knows where to attach to that, you know, and make you feel unworthy and then give, you know, the slightest drip of, oh, you know, good boy, maybe you actually get your hundred percent paycheck and, you know, not scammed again this, this week or month or whatever, you know, or not get, uh, uh, you know, you can, you can consider yourself lucky if you, if your boss didn't scream at you this month or something, <laughs> I was never really, in, I mean, yeah, I wasn't really much in these like servile jobs or something. You, you called them one time. Mm -hmm. Um, I just looked, but I looked at some aspects of it, you know, I worked a tiny bit also as somewhat of freelancer or part-time in the marketing agency. I worked for like, to do like translations. I did different things, but enough to experience enough of, let's say, psychopathic boss behavior. Um, yeah, it's just pretty toxic environments oftentimes, you know, either toxic or heavily ideolog ideologized. Is this how you would say it? Ideological. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or highly ideological, like even with the startup and it wasn't overt, it's actually like a, a popular company still around. And even back then, you know, with simple things like, uh, and I wasn't as up to speed on it as I am now, but even then it was like, oh, we have this cool client who will use our software. It's Lady Gaga, you know, <laughs> and already back then I was like, oh boy, you know, I'm not sure if that's really a good sign, you know? Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, so you had that, so you had that experience with, uh, with cannabis and, uh, you know, the world, world kind of expanded. Uh, and I guess, uh, um, to, I guess, could you, could you fill in the, I, I'm curious, uh, you know, like when, when you started getting into some of the, I guess the deeper and bigger subjects like, uh, Tartaria and historical resets and such. And, uh, if you kind of want to fill in the gaps there, I'd, yeah, feel free. Right. So, I mean, there's many big gaps, but I would say okay. the, the real biggest, uh, 
or most important aspect to understand actually is about reality creation. And that's what I mostly, at least conceptually, got around to by 2014. I also did some presentation, but in this case in German. To summarize some of Bashar's teaching and some of the other things I had read from books and different religions and so on, that for me was like the core thing and also, if you will, the culmination of a, let's say, almost 10 year quest in a sense to answer the question that I mentioned initially, where does authority come from? And then I was like, okay, now I can explain all authority comes from yourself. And now I have enough metaphysical understanding and at least some practical experience to be able to relay that. Um, which was really like the most important core point for me, because once we understand that, then we understand that all reality, as I had mentioned, is based on your belief system and also in particular, any and all input you receive from the apparent outside, um, all that energy fundamentally is neutral. All the circumstance is neutral. And what's really important is the energy you put into it. So the way you interpret it and what I always like to use here is these images, you know, where you can see uh, skull and bones, but at the same time, it's a mirror and you can see like a beautiful woman uh, mm. putting on makeup or something in the mirror. And it's like an image you see both at the same time, right? Depending on what you focus on. Mm. Um, so I would really say that's the, that's the main point because once one understands this interpretational sovereignty one has over one's reality and that one is to a very large extent free to create their own reality by uh, by changing their own belief systems this is kind of like the core mechanism which can also in a sense explain why there are so many different perceptions and ways of life and belief system existing in parallel even only within humanity itself yeah so this is at least what greatly helped me to really understand this metaphysical um, idea of belief system structures and how they very much are the basis for the creation of also physicalized reality mm -hmm. um and then basically i was kind of happy with that i got a bit more into the whole let's say alien topics and so on. Also, this was something I had not gone into for some years because I had said, well, this is not important enough. We have enough problems here, let's say, mm -hmm. until I realized that whatever these UFOs are exactly or these etheric entities, um, there are too many reports of whether, you know, lights in the sky or strange visions and different types of entities appearing. There's a whole lot to say about this in terms of what which of those experiences may even be let's say artificially created by some kind of a human deep state you know there is plenty of hints towards that even with i believe the cattle mutilation and even some kind of alien abduction scenarios there is some hints that they may even have had some kind of a cia let's say operation where they basically dressed up as aliens you know they torture you and so on and then later they can say oh it was the bad alien you know like don't blame your government it was the aliens right mm -hmm. so it's <laughs> there's many um many facets to this but the basic point with the aliens just being that if you have an object in the sky and there's good movies about this or even on the floor um for example crop circle diaries i forgot her name now but the, it's even on youtube where you can just see like a uh, light basically forming on the ground out of nothing on like a crop crop field and then you can see this ball of light moving around and perfectly flattening out the crops you know mm -hmm. and they they had some professor look at the crops and look at also known fake crop cir circles and could tell in detail that the fake crop circles are mechanically broken. You know, the wheat is mechanically broken with like a rope or something. But with the others, there is some kind of a thermal, I believe, imprint. So it's just a different type of technology or a different, something different is happening there, you know. And again, I'm not claiming I know what is what, but there is too much evidence and also too much scientific inquiry already into this to basically um, discard the whole, whatever, alien and advanced technology idea and where the rubber meets the road <clears throat> and why the whole UFO topic has been 
ridiculed for all these years is because as soon as I either accept this idea with the crop circles that, you know, there's some unknown technology and some light bolts, you know, uh, rolling around or flying around, or if I accept any of the many uh, UFO reports where I also have some sorts of light or some kind of vehicle and it's moving in patterns and with a speed that is completely out of bounds of the accepted, you know, F-16 military technology or whatever we have, then it immediately points towards number one, the idea that there is much more advanced technology than humanity is allowed to positively benefit from. But also it very quickly points towards the idea of some sort of advanced energy generation or transformation technology that must be available, which then again either would mean some type of free or abundant energy is deliberately being withheld from humanity, or it would mean there is some kind of superior life form or civilization that is also not being talked about because it would again threaten the perceived supremacy of the human control system we have here. Does it make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. And, and I guess um, I, I have to ask, are you, are you familiar with uh, uh, the work of uh, Ross Ben by chance? Ever come across, come across no. That? Okay. Well, he's he's this guy uh, from out in Philadelphia, and um, he he did uh, um, he he looked at like I guess the cult origins of, of Philadelphia, and there's some really really wild stuff there, um, in a good way. I I, I think he's he's definitely onto something. But um, he also talks about um, crop circles and that they're they're messages from what he calls I think the Star Family um, or something along those lines. So there's it's uh, it's it, I really I really really appreciate Ross Ben. I mean, um, he's he's one of those folks that I immediately resonated with. So yeah, if you haven't checked if you haven't uh, heard of him. Um, he's got a channel on uh, on YouTube, um, and he does uh, he does uh, I guess yearly, um, you know, looking at uh, um, like yearly I guess horoscopes you could say, and um, yeah he he was uh, he was on it I guess like late not late 2019 he said in 2020 they were going for like it was going to be a global resource reset um, was was what what he saw in the stars and he's been he's been he's he's pretty tuned in so um he uh yeah i guess the the i bring him up because he talks about the crop circles and um he, he i guess there's some some interesting stuff um so yeah you might you might want to look in look into him and i also came across i think she was on higher side chats um but uh she did some she did documentaries on crop circles and um they uh they, they did ex like extensive testing of the uh testing of these fields in the uk and um the um it Patty was they Greer. Were, okay Patty Patty Greer. Greer, was that her okay so like i guess they they they, they, they crop figured, circle diaries that's okay, her yeah. that's her okay i couldn't remember her name but i guess i guess yeah it was uh, basically the plasma some sort of plasma um plasma energy and they found out that there's like 15 or 20 percent more mineral minerals and vitamins it was healthier food after after this happened so like there's some there's some wild there's, oh i forgot that one mm -hmm. yeah yeah there's some wild stuff for sure um and i don't i don't mean wild in a bad way it's just like it's wild as in like, like far outside of the bounds of what I, th I thought reality was before so um uh so yeah i guess um where does uh um so you mentioned the free energy thing is that kind of the tie-in to um I guess the, the tie into, um, I guess, Tartaria and that, that sort of uh, subject. Yeah, basically I, I mentioned the alien topic because it was kind of a, for me at least prerequisite in a, in a sense, or in my exploration, it just came beforehand because what also opens up here and I'm not dogmatic in any way. That's why I also mentioned, you know, there is the TR3B, which is like, you can even look this up. There's a, quite a few very interesting Google patterns actually. Both the patterns are interesting, or you can find it through Google Patterns, and also the names of the guys that register it. Like there is some kind of magnet motor and some kind of UFO, and they are, I think they they are done by a guy whose name in Spanish literally means something like savior of the world or something like this. Like there's some interesting patent documents, you know, publicly available, and you know, <laughs> to look up. Well, I'm just mentioning this is it's always. Um, you know, up to one's own discernment to then be able to tell, you know, what is a real phenomena, what is a natural occurrence and what is another control system contrivance, you know, mm -hmm. and I can't say that I have the final answers to this. I can only say there's too much evidence that at least there are some aspects which are not controlled and not, you know, done by some sort, sort, sort of a deep state or something. At the same time, it's pretty clear that they try the best they can 
to co-opt all of these storylines and ideas to the best of their abilities to steer humanity in their direction. And ideally, what they would love to do, of course, is to be able to masquerade as aliens, even benevolent aliens or whatever, and then again, be able to trick humanity, you know. Um, maybe just to, to round this out, because anyone who's familiar with Bashar, and again, highly recommended, he's gone in a sense kind of sideways the past few years. So what I'd maybe just like to mention about all of this is that ultimately, you know, I'd like to say you're never really being let off the hook in terms of always in each and every moment, again, making your own choice of discernment and uh, being able to feel out your own resonance as to what rings true and where do you sense there's more to the story or where you sense you're being deceived. There's never really like, you know, a surefire way to know or you know, one particular channel or podcast or anything to listen to. I think we even mentioned this on the Team Rabbit Hole show. Even if someone's wrong, you can learn from them. Mm -hmm. But I think it's always important, you know, always remind yourself you have the authority, you have the interpretational sovereignty. And ultimately, if these metaphysical principles are correct, then only what you decide for yourself to adopt as a belief system, a belief system and perspective can really affect you and really matters to you. And everything anybody says is merely an offer of a belief system and perspective, which you can accept or not. It's just that this process is so oftentimes done unconsciously. And then, you know, we carry around all the baggage, you know, and all the trauma of everyone and think it's normal just because it got, uh, you know, accepted subconsciously. <clears throat> so anyhow, with that as a basis, um, and also understanding that, yeah, there's at the very least two or even more sides to these kind of stories. Again, you know, where is the alien really coming from? Or why I mention this actually is because of you may be familiar with um, some of the, let's say, globe skepticism, or other people would say flat earth, uh, mm -hmm community or theories. And for them, oftentimes, at least, there is a very strong dogma against any type of aliens or etherics, you know, where it's like, no, there can be no other entities, all that exists is only this realm. And there's the firmament and we're basically locked in here and everything else is a demon or something, you know. So even here again, then very quickly, there's a kind of a judgment being applied. And I just think it's really important to stay neutral and be able to really sort it out and ideally be able to have different types of systems of uh, frameworks of explanation and ideally be able to sustain the cognitive dissonance of contemplating them all eventually at the same time and allowing them somehow to merge or to really be very discerning in terms of which rule, let's say, or which assumption really checks out the most in actually applied reality and ideally has little to no exceptions. And if it has any exceptions, I need to be aware of them. You know, it's kind of a tricky game, uh, I think, to be able to um, stay neutral and not get into, into any of these pitfalls. Um, so anyhow, I'm mentioning Flat Earth basically because a lot of the Tartarian history reset research is also kind of somehow tied into flat earth, I want to say, mm -hmm. or at least to globe skepticism. So there is, um, there's all kinds of things coming together. And even here, maybe a simple example, if we just talk about the idea of old maps, then supposedly up to the 1920s, pretty much all the maps that were displayed were, um, you know, these like circle type maps were around, you have the ice ring, right? That was the common projection of the world for the longest time and the globes, the way they are now, from what I understand, they are very, very recent. Um, maybe what I just wanna say is that even here, if you find any particular stream of thought or ideology, oftentimes each flavor with certain of the proponents comes with their own type of dogmatism. And it's just super important to be aware of this yourself and then for yourself be able to discern, okay, do I want to accept the dogma that for example, this let's say flat plain realm with a dome is the only thing that exists. Or maybe I have had myself other types of experiences or insights or visions or whatever. And then I need to reconcile that again. You know, there's always, you know, how do you say, Syn um, thesis, antithesis, synthesis, right? Mm -hmm. yep. And this is a never ending journey. Um, 
yeah so to answer your question a few years after all of that maybe three four years after realizing all these alien topics and thinking about them i actually saw a podcast maybe you have heard of sarah westall oh uh, yeah i have i think i've uh, i'm not a listener but i've listened to it twice for for, for guests she had on um so yeah i think I, I think i'm familiar yeah and I was actually, funnily enough, playing a game called Crusader Kings, which is like a, you basically have a map in front of you. It's a video game, and uh, you're a medieval lord, and you are. Um, it's more like a role-playing game and state simulation in a sense. And you expand your territory. You can create religions and cultures and so on, make alliances. But of course, it's using the let's say official timeline of whatever official history is. You know, it's playing in the years, let's say. 900 to 1400 or something yeah um and i'm playing this game and i'm thinking to myself oh, it's kind of interesting you know the game is well done but of course any type of data they have will have been derived from official history and how can i trust that if i already know you know history is written by the winners there's all kinds of discrepancies and it's kind of you know a long shot to assume that whatever they put in the game is actually what happened, but many people would probably just play it and again subconsciously kind of assume that it's accurate enough, right? Mm -hmm. And what I'm doing when playing games is I'm listening to podcasts. So I was listening to Sarah Westall and there was Sylvie Ivanova of megaliths.org or New Earth um, channel on YouTube. Maybe you've heard her, heard of her. She's one of not. the, it's like quite, quite, she was the first researcher that I found. Mm. And at that point, she was only talking about the idea that I believe they had found some roads that were inconsistent with the history. And most specifically, they had realized that, for example, um, wood, I believe, can petrify much quicker than they would have expected. So basically just realizing that we're in mainstream history, one would arrive and say, oh, this is, you know, petrified. This is very old. You know, this must be at least, let's say, a thousand years old. It's the Neolithic period or something like this. Yeah? But then they realized that even um, they pulled out something out of a swamp or something, and it seemed to be super old and ancient. And then they realized, oh, it's a boot from the First or Second World War or something like this. So she simply brought up the idea that much of what we understand, even with carbon dating and stuff like that, is much more subject to individual interpretation, subjective interpretation, than it is an actually objective exact science. And you have examples like petrified wood, where generally we would assume a much, much different timeline than to the time it really takes for something like this to form, which of course then completely throws your historical um, orientation off right um if one is not aware of these things and um, yeah she brought it up and then i was i guess watching some of her videos and then pretty quickly you know it, there's the whole mud flood topic she also talks about because she also talks about the reset and i'm not sure how much she uses the term tartaria itself mm -hmm. but um yeah just basically starting with the idea that many of the historical artifacts we may observe may simply be completely incorrectly dated so that's how i started with this and then you know there is also one other blog post a recent one it's called tartaria research collection on my website to anyone interested in you know just opening up a few channels i have a few recommendations and a few recommended videos of maybe 10 15 different channels um, because it's a huge topic you know and uh, take some time to wrap once mind around it yeah, properly yeah that's no shit yeah i've i've put quite a few hours in and it's still and I, i've listened to ari Oslin run through his uh his i guess his theory um you know a dozen times and i'm still confused um but uh um but yeah i guess for for the audience um i'll just mention that um for any any of these kind of i guess more out there topics that aren't just directly pertaining to self-liberation i still find immense value um like I, there's always like like we've said multiple times over the past couple episodes you can you can learn you can find truth in everything and um the free energy topic was one that i stumbled across um you know what watching documentaries like that um and just a couple episodes ago Raphael interviewed this guy named uh, Sky Huddleston who's um he's a and he's the uh, proprietor of a liberator rocket heater it's like 99.8 
percent efficiency. Um, he said that they got the test results back, and it was uh, uh, more efficient, uh, more efficient or as efficient as SpaceX. It's one of their similar things or something. So apparently, it's a pretty good product. Uh, but anyway, he's working on a different. Um, he's working on a small engine, um, and I. I I'm not even gonna try to explain what the hell he's what what the hell he's doing because it's it's I'm still working my working my my my, my head around it but um, he's uh, he's working into he's working on some some pretty incredible stuff um, and you know he says you know handful of years or so um, I guess it'd be a, a, a kilowatt generator um, is that, or megawatt a megawatt generator um, basically in every house super affordably you can run on like charcoal like charcoal I guess they're called charcoal slushies just water and charcoal. Um, it's, it's pretty nuts. Um, but all this stuff is out there and, um, you know, I can definitely, I can definitely see why, um, you know, you, you start looking, you start looking into some of these topics and you realize how, like, like I've said multiple times in, uh, the last few podcasts, like the Serval Society is a fucking scam, um, through and through and through. Um, and then, yeah, you, you come across like George Wiseman and he had, you know, he had a, a truck that had like 200 miles, per, got like 200 miles per gallon back in, you know, a while ago. And for even not 200 miles per gallon, you can get like 20% more with, with it, with like a $15 part. So like all of this, everything is just, uh, yeah, such a scam. And there's not really a question there, but I'm, I'm sure you've come across, <laughs> I'm sure you're, you're kind of, uh, on a similar, similar wavelength there. Yes. Yeah, so, um. Totally. There's even like, I think a Mercedes or something from early nineties. I mean, this is now recent, but even here that also only would take, I think two liters or maybe one gallon per hundred or 150 miles or whatever, you know, no one ever heard of it again. We know there are patented workable designs of electric cars going back to probably 1900 at least. Right. Mm -hmm. Or probably then they even had electric cars, even if they went slow, but you know, so th there's all these things. Um, also, just so I don't forget, in terms of liberation and why it does relate your audience mm -hmm. to self-liberation is because how how can I be free and how can I make a free choice in my own and, if you will, my cultures and my species and my planets and however else I relate, best interest, if I don't know who I am, if I don't know where I'm coming from, if I don't know where I'm going to. These are, uh, I almost want to say, you know, the Jesuit targets, you know, of confusing individuals. You're not allowed to know who you are, which is, you know, one with the infinite creator and ultimately, and you know, you yourself, infinite fractal, in ultimately indestructible at your core, being that has nothing to fear unless you want to play the scary ride of human incarnation and believing in your own self-limitation. Um, where you're coming from, where they always have to tell you, oh, humanity has always been warlike, humans are bad, you know, although these qualities exist and it's important, like we discussed, not to be naive, but this is a very, I still believe at least, you know, slim and small, uh, um, let's say proclivity in a sense within humanity in general, and also a very small percentage, if even percentage of humanity that really acts it out in that negatively polarized way, However, of course, we allow them to get into positions of authority and power and have adopted a servile state of mind and a slave state of mind that allows such a system to be per perpetuated. Um, but this very much also includes the idea of, like I said, where we come from, because imagine if in official textbooks they would tell you, well, you know, only, let's say, maybe 300 years ago, maybe 500 years ago, there was, let's say, an Atlantean type civilization, just in terms of very advanced, you know, abundant energy available, high culture, high spirituality, then whatever system we have now could never even come up with a proposal, which it does now all the time, or the assertion that, you know, this is the best system we ever had. You know, just like mm -hmm. Churchill supposedly said or whoever, yeah. Yeah, we know democracy is really bad, you know, but it's the best we have. I mean, what a joke. If you know about the background and, you know, the engineering of consent, Edward Bernays propaganda and so on, it's a huge scam set up right from the start. It only matter. It don't, the only question is whether one is on a higher level of um, elite controller faction to really be aware of it, because of course, what they always need is ideally a whole army of true believers 
or I believe in communism, they call them useful idiots that actually play it out, you know, and play parliament and play, you know, this party, that party and opposition proposal and whatever, when at the very core, in my understanding, at least modern democracy is nothing else, but how do you most effectively pit individuals against each other by uh, assuming a party against another party. And there you have division right from the start. So it makes no sense to me at all. Um, but anyhow, within this whole complex of understanding the question of where we come from and what our true history is, in my point of view, is incredibly relevant, even though also me, after years of many, many hours <laughs> of engaging in this topic, I can't tell you the exact timeline or whatever. I got, you know, some hints and some good information and some good insights. Um, but I just know, let's say maybe it's not the most important thing to solve, but it's certainly something to look out for and which could also then, you know, just like I said, rectify our own self image, you know, um, because if you yeah. really understand our true history, I'm sure we can move forward much more effectively as well, or even just being aware, for example, very simple thing in terms of history. We had an electric car in 1910 or even 1870 or something. I just saw some videos. Apparently even the US Postal Service had like these black vans, which were electric cars long, long time ago, you know? Yeah. And this is not this is not even going into any Atlantean history or Tartarian history, but even just still being aware of that immediately then screams you're being scammed at you in the present time when they try to come around with a Tesla that nobody can afford. And then the battery is probably going to pollute your whole water and so on or whatever, you know, it's like, you can tell there's something wrong. If a hundred years ago, we already had this, you know, you're being yeah. scammed, just like I said. <laughs> yeah. And, and, <laughs> and historical and I, understanding helps a lot. Yeah. And the other important thing too, is that, um, like the, I, I kind of got the conception. This was my, my, my conception growing up. It was the programming was that like, this is the way things have been for thousands of years. So like, it's not going to change any, it's not going to change anytime soon. This is the way things are and have been. Um, well, some, some elements may be, may be fine, but, um, if you look back, like a lot of the researchers, like, uh, um, I, I particularly like Michelle Gibson and, you know, Howdy McCoskey to name a couple, um, like a, a lot of these folks will put like, you know, I guess, uh, you know, the, the, the big reset date somewhere between like, you know, seven, you know, late 1700s to like 1850 or somewhere, somewhere in that time frame. Um, like, I guess that, uh, um, that, I guess the mud flood or whatever you want to call it. So like with that, with that in mind, um, you know, all these, all these hours of research. And again, these aren't like, these aren't, it's, it's just, they're just like operating conclusions. No, we're not even really conclusions, just theories at this point. But at the same time, like if, if, even if it's just a theory, if it happens to be correct, and this has only been that way for like 150 years, um, then like, that's pretty significant, right? Like, so this is the anomaly in history per, per se, not necessarily the other way around. Um, if that, yeah, if that, if that makes sense. Yes, and uh, from what I had heard, I hadn't read him, but Jim brought this up a few times on the show, is that Philip K. Dick, apparently, in his books, actually talks about this idea that we exist in some kind of a time loop. Sounds pretty scary, but um, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, but now I'm always joking and I'm like, well, if I had to bet money, you know, most often by now I'll bet on the conspiracy, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, I guess at least from the last two years, you know, it's become the even more uh, rational choice than, you know, to naively believe what everyone uh, had been told. Um, and yeah, just to maybe affirm it from another point of view and to give some practical information in terms of nutrition, mm -hmm. you mentioned 1850s. There's many interesting dates, 1850s also when they officially at least made big reforms to the monarchy in Austria, to the supposed Austrian empire and all of that. Um, you know, history gets murky very, very quick. However, what can be traced back around 1850, I believe as well, is the adoption of grain processing, mm -hmm. wheat processing, grain processing. And uh, what happened then is the idea, the official timeline then, it was some kind of a chemist. I have a friend, a dear friend of mine who spent 10 years researching and promoting this idea, which is why I can now talk about it in a somewhat succinct fashion. And basically what happened is they started remo removing the seed, I believe, call it the seed or the germ from the, no matter whether it's rice, 
in the case of rice, I believe you remove the outer layer. In terms of wheat, there isn't industrial processing where you remove the inner core. Mm. And you basically do that because then if you store it, you can basically store it indefinitely. And the idea was supposedly that because of, I would say, artificially created scarcity through war and strife and whatever, there supposedly was a lack of food. And then some smart chemist researchers and so on came up with the idea, oh, if we process wheat in this way, we can store it a lot longer. And, uh, you know, all of these benefits so nobody ever has to feel hunger again. So I think it was a reaction to famine, according to the official timeline. However, what either they didn't tell you back then, they didn't know, they didn't care about it, or they maybe thought it was just a temporary measure, I don't know. But the issue, of course, is if you remove a part of the plant, you remove a part of the, let's say, nutritional makeup of that plant. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, guess where all the minerals, vitamins, whatever other secondary plant-based, you know, nutritional substances and so on, take a wild guess where they can be found in a... Mm -hmm. Yeah in grain, for example, or in wheat, yeah? They can, of course, to about 98% be found in exactly the part that is being industrially removed since about 1850. And then the real issue becomes that because it looks the same, and at least in first moment, it tastes the same, but it has basically none of the nutritional value, then basically what you're doing whilst before you may have had the issue of a certain segment of the population, maybe literally starving or not, you know, I wasn't there, but, you know, having great strife and struggle because there is nothing to eat, to now feeding the entire population through your processed flour, but starving them simultaneously and starving all of them because they even are not aware that what they're eating now is basically not nutrition anymore. And then imagine mm -hmm. even the effect only this would have on their consciousness in terms of driving them into a scarcity-based mindset. And even just this small story of grain processing, you know, can tell you how civilization got effed over big time. And, you know, there could be assumptions, like my friend said, you know, we only discovered vitamins in 1920 or whatever. And I was like, I'm sorry, like, you know, whether it's the Chinese or however you call them, but people know about Qi, Ayurvedics know about constitution, mm -hmm. all of that. And if anyone would have asked around, you know, even if we imagine some kind of monarchy system in that age or whatever, you know, I'll have connections to the Shah of Persia or whoever, or the whatever of India and be like, oh, what do you think about this, you know? And they would tell you, yeah, you're, you're completely crazy if you do this, you know? <laughs> if there was something like honest communication between these people and there was some knowledge remaining somewhere, you know, or I asked my, I'm making this up now, but you know, I'm asking my Ayurvedic courtier or someone who came along for journeying and I'll ask the Ayurvedic doctor what he thinks about it and he'll immediately tell you it's completely insane to do that, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, <clears throat> But that it's something that has gone completely unnoticed and basically all the bread, almost all the bread you can buy, if it's not really explicitly made that way to have, let's say, the full complete grain included and processed that way, then you always get denaturated wheat, but it's still called wheat. It's still called grain. It's still called bread. There is no distinction being made in terminology. And by now it's just like with Tesla motors. Now, if I ask you about Tesla, you're going to ask if I have a new fancy car. Mm -hmm. But that's just obfuscation of the actual relevance. And even Tesla potentially is only like a small um, remnant storyline, maybe even psyop of somehow subsuming the whole idea of potentially the entire Tartarian free energy civilization, just assuming, you know, and just, you know, packing it into the story of this only one Tesla guy who is this big genius, who knows, maybe just shortly before there was a huge civilization built on the technologies that Tesla described. I don't know. Yeah. But here I just want to point out that if you just replace the product, you use the same name, people don't notice, you can basically poison them, confuse them and so on. Because, you know, as so often, even with the pandemic now, they don't know what's inside, you know, and they don't care enough to ask and to check it out and to compare. 
and then you get into big big problems yeah so yeah 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 that's so uh, just this example in terms of reset yeah yeah that's uh that's a great point uh just re-released a uh, an episode an old L an old Elio radio episode from like 2017 with jamin baconic he's a permaculture farmer and uh that the conversation we got into um i guess uh talked about permaculture farming we talked about the conventional agricultural culture too and he brought up um, the term serial state um, because that's also if you look at it from a you know authoritarian central centralized authority uh, you know point of view um, it's a lot easier to track like grain and wheat than it is like other things um, so like they can basically centralize the food production around those items and then control the and control the economic flow too um, so it was a really yeah really interesting so yeah like how you get gov governments like this I mean you've, I'm sure you've heard the uh, who the hell is it? it's attributed is it Kissinger you know control food you control the people that that long quote i mean it's basic like it makes sense it's it's um yeah it's just um yeah new i guess new ways to think about uh think about some of these things but um yeah it's funny like with uh <clears throat> like i i've been getting into like i don't think about spacex i don't think about elon musk i don't think about these people and these companies so like when i th when i think about tesla and i talk about like I'm, I'm reading tesla papers right now and i'm reading uh you know a, a book on all the patents for free energy um but uh like so like any when i when i'm conversing with people now i have to say fake tesla um so it's uh you know like oh no that's fake tesla um but anyway yeah it's it's uh it definitely i mean it doesn't make things easier that's for sure and um yeah i, I mean that's that's been the biggest the biggest line of research from looking at you know historical resets was is, is i guess the decentralized breakthrough energy topic because it's not just that there's like one or two ways it's like a dozen um like it's not hard to do it's it's it's, it's really not you know the difficult um, it's just that you get people like Stanley Meyer, who in the 1990s were on the precipice of, you know, some pretty incredible things. Um, they get poisoned or they get, they kill, they kill themselves with two bolts in the back of the head or something like that happens. Um, because like, this is the, this whole realm is like, it's all about, you know, like, so we talked about time control earlier. Um, well, the way that time is calculated in this realm is, um, you know, is by, uh, you know, is by, by money or by energy um that's how the that's how the energy is measured is, is in money so like you control control that at that level you're controlling the energy flow um so like that's that's taking like that's that's like that's even bigger than i would say like just like the federal reserve or something like that like that's the entire um you know energy attention if the if the attention isn't focused where they want it to like this whole thing's gonna gonna fall apart you know exactly Exactly. If basically, if we do not accept, you know, the fear and scarcity programming that they try to subconsciously trick us and traumatize us into accepting and recreating, then it's game over. Because again, all authority comes from yourself. How this can also be verified, you know, Henry David Sorrow wrote about this in Walden, for example. You know, you are. Uh, it, it is bad to have a southern overseer. It is worse to have a northern one, but the very worst thing is you is if you are both slave and slave driver yourself. Hmm. And you know, this whole slave driver is internalized. There is no police, there is no state, there is no government, there is no external authority. It can have no sway over you at all if you do not choose in each and every moment to internalize it and act accordingly. So there is no and also what I always love to bring up is Ashby's law of requisite variety, um, which basically determines that any system can only be completely controlled by another system if that other system is at the very least equally complex. And if then we truly understand we are not bio robots or whatever, which of course they want us to believe so the whole system mm -hmm. can function accordingly, but that we each are actually infinitely con complex, there's probably some kind of, you know, probably even for lack of a better term, you know, black holes in each and every whatever DNA that you have and, you know, all kinds of miraculous processes going on in the body and some whatever kind of quantum fields, you know, possibility to receive from what you would call your subconscious, your connection to the infinite, to all other entities. You know, there is infinite uh, complexity and input variability into the human system it can never be controlled by an externalized hierarchy or authority however the authority can make you believe that you're only a mechanized bio robot pretty dumb useless and worthless 
And if you again believe it, you will recreate that reality and you will then fuel, let's say, their version of the servile society where a few people can feel like, I don't know, God emperors or something, if they even feel that way, I don't know, um, and sustain this, you know, <laughs> choke of a system. <laughs> and one example for free energy or just energy efficiency, because just like you said, this is also something I thought about and many years back, even before many of these realizations, I was like, okay, there's energy conversion and often it's very ineffective, right? And I'm like, how much energy gets lost only because we have bad conversion tech, yeah? And of yeah. course we waste all our food and there's so many things we do wrong, right? And over fertilize the, with chemical fertilizers, which all ties back to the Rockefeller oil and medicine mm -hmm. story, you know, it's all a big shit show, right? But um, one simple example of a German company, I believe they were called GWE and the thing in German was called Blockheitskraftwerk. I believe this was in about 2013 or something when it came up and I believe all they did it was some kind of a box and I think you only put in water or something and I think the only thing that came out was also water and yeah. it, maybe I think you used 80% water 20% of some kind of oil that you get some from, from some um, I forgot the proper term now, some kind of a grain, right? Mm -hmm. And you mix it and it just creates pretty much energy. It doesn't really create waste. You don't need lots of inputs, very effective. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And uh, made the rounds in alternative media in, I think about 2013. And then suddenly they got raided. Yeah, Everything was confiscated and the company was closed. And he was accused, the main engineer was accused of taking too much money and, you know, basically doing all the things the deep state likes to do, right? So scamming people, basically. Even though when he was presenting it, he got many offers from all kinds of people wanting to invest infinite amounts of millions into the project. And he actually said, well, I'm only gonna accept, let's say, 30 million now or something. So he was even toning it down. He was like, wait, guys, I'm only taking this amount of money because that's as much as I can produce right now. And then, you know, we'll see in the next round but it never got to that because he got raided. And then he even got to prison. I'm not sure if he went to prison, but they had this kind of a court case, which was completely, you know, faked up and a complete joke. But he even managed within that court case to enter the evidence with a notary, you know, so officially sanctified that his device actually is working, you know, and is doing whatever he claims it was doing and he was not scamming anybody. Yeah. Um, and what he also then said is that just before they got raided, he got um, a visit by the German Nachrichtendienst, uh, Secret Service, right? Or not Secret Service, not for the president, you know, the like CIA version, whatever, mm -hmm. FBI, you know, CIA, <laughs> NSA, whatever, um, Nachrichtendienst. Uh, and they basically told him, well, you know, what you have here is really nice. We would really love to buy it, you know? And he's like, well, you know, I mean, I am in a way an entrepreneur, so I don't mind making money, but I'm also an engineer. So I really want to have good solutions for everybody. So I'm not really interested in you having just, just buying it. Yeah? Um, and what they had also mentioned, this is highly interesting is they said, yeah, well, actually what we would like to do, we would like to take your technology and combine it with this Indian company that does, and now pay attention, wind turbines for offshore. And because there's this whole huge question, I'm not saying that wind energy can't work at all. I just know that there's huge issues with, you know, what materials they use, where they put it, fish and animals dying and bad electromagnetic fields and all kinds mm -hmm. of problems, which could be done a lot smarter. But just with the current implementations, I would really wonder, this was just in my mind, was like, yeah, of course, then I'm putting all these offshore windmills there. And I can pretend that they are so effective and create such great and sustainable energy or whatever. And there's mm -hmm. not all of this supposed, if this is even a real story, voltage issues and so on. Yeah, um, I can much more easily do that if I have these wind turbines and at the bottom or something, I have one of these Blockheitskraftwerke, which are super effective, right? And if for whatever reason, the wind turbine is running or not or whatever, I just have this basically sequestered efficient energy technology secretly built in and you know and i can still sell the power really uh, expensively or whatever i want to do mm -hmm. you know so yeah 
that's just one simple real life uh, story of sequestered tech and how the deep state or whoever you want to, the control system wants to use it, but not tell you about it. Yeah. Which of course then raises the further question. And I'm not saying I believe this or not, but I'm really asking the question even today, to what extent is the energy grid really based on the technology and power sources that they claim it is? I don't know. I can't know. All that I find suspicious is that is that with the new power technologies, we have these power lines running around the whole country, even in Austria. I mean, everywhere, right? Yep. And if we know from induction, we know fruit from induction, for example, um, that there is ways to create and transfer energy. And if there actually is some kind of an ether or some kind of a movement um, within the ether, or lack of a better term, it could also be energy be energizing the system just by virtue of having all of those power lines laying around for example i'm not saying that this is what actually happens i'm just saying that there's a lot of questions here as well especially if we know stories such as the one i just told you about that we don't even really know what they actually use in the back end same goes of course just one small rabbit hole with the whole nuclear power Mm -hmm. I had just watched another great documentary. I'm not sure if you had heard of Windsor Galen, the guy who built many of the first nuclear power plants, I believe I initially yeah, plutonium based in America. And then he always took a swim in the, in the cooler water. And then for many years he did presentations and eat plutonium in front of the classroom and so on. And basically told people that there's nothing to be afraid of, but there's a huge racketeering, uh, a scam with insurances for um, nuclear waste and everyone's scared of it. And in Austria, even there is a huge political um, meme or almost foundational principle of Austria that I don't know, 30 years ago, we had this big vote against a new nuclear power plant. The first and only one that would have been built. And they had already built it, but they didn't, did never start operating it because supposedly it's so insecure. Again, I don't know if it's true, but just what I had learned and the same with NASA and SpaceX and the same with the current scandemic, if I am not able to get the proper device, you know, whether a microscope or a telescope, or just be able to get into that nuclear power plant and really understand the science of whatever's happening there or nuclear weapons, which would be the other scare tactic. If I don't really understand it myself, at the very least, it makes not a lot of sense to be very scared of it because it may as well just be another artificial threat scenario that can be perpetrated on the masses due to their lack of knowledge. Does it make mm -hmm. sense? Yeah, yeah, it, uh, it it definitely does. It definitely does. And um, <laughs> yeah, you make a you make a lot of a lot of really good points. There's a lot of uh, windmill farms around here. There's solar farms around around too. But I think a lot of these programs are um, just ways to uh, you know funnel money where they want to. Um, there was uh, back when I start initially started Audio Radio. I'll just say a contributor and just leave it at that. Um, contributed an article to the site basically looking at so this is like 2012 so like I, I this was even even before i'd had my first you know first time i voted the only time i ever voted so like this is way back then but the, the person did a, wrote an article on like looking at like the top 25 solar companies that had gotten you know bailout gotten you know a bunch of the subsidy money and like 98 percent of them are already already out of business within like a year so like it was it's it was ob obvious what's going on it wasn't for energy independence um no, none of the solutions proffered by the first realm by the servile society um will ever be for energy you know energy independence and um that's what you know sky sky house exactly. was coming on here like um when, when sky was on here a couple weeks ago he was talking about or i guess a handful of handful of episodes ago or so um he was talking about how like um like so like the cost of solar panels is going to be to the point where it's cheaper than shingles and such. So like you're going to put solar panels on your house, but like you aren't really going to care how much they're getting because like it's just going to be like they're just there and they're just generating power. Like it's not your primary. Um, it's just a it's just a backup. Um, but like as far as like a and like the the way they're they're rolled out now, like it still requires centralized infrastructure, centralized control, and centralized distribution, and a lot of the a lot of the um, solar panels that are being put in, like they're connected to the grid anyway. So like they, the the power company is is getting the 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 
Um, and then the, the private owners are getting uh, getting uh, you know money back um, for putting the solar panels on. So it's another way to subsidize the power grid the way it is. And then they pay them back probably a small pittance at the end of the month or at the end of the year for you know power. But they're charging you know 10x times that or however much they're however much they're doing it. But uh, um, yeah, it's just it's it's frustrating. But at the same time, it's exciting too because. Um, that's, I mean, that's one thing that's, uh, you know, like, I guess and it's still theoretical now. Like there's not really a, there's not really a, this is all theoretical for me anyway, but like at some point, if we are able to get like, you know, the decentralized breakthrough energy, um, like a, 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 I guess a, a setup implemented, the problem comes in with patents. Like Stanley Meyer was doing the patents and such in a very strategic way so that, cause he was apparently he was into, or he was, um, he was aware of the new world order and stuff. So like he was doing it very stealthily. Uh, he was just, uh, one of his business partners were just, was just interviewed by Amanda Vollmer recently. Um, the only time I'd ever heard anyone connected with him, but um, some interesting stuff. I haven't had a chance to finish it yet, but he was talking about how Stanley was really strategic with the patents and um, they still, they found out eventually. So like, I think the way this has to be done is like no patents, no, no, it can't be economic. I'm just it just thinking. Has be, I'm it just has to be rolled out, rolled out underground before they know. What, I'm what sorry, them. but if I'm, yeah, yeah, but also if I'm aware of the quote unquote new world order or control structure or whatever, then I know who runs the patent office, you know, and supposedly there was even, I don't, you know, this is just something I'd heard, but even in some kind of initial conflict between the US and the UK or something, mm -hmm. uh, one of the things they supposedly raided or whatever in America was the patent office, you know, so, um, and where did Einstein come from? He was sitting on the patent office, you know, and then he mm -hmm. was uh, excluding the ether from all the equations and put us mm -hmm. down uh, you know it's a huge story itself so basically all i want to say is i consider it quite naive to believe that you can circumvent the control structure but you're still gonna have any patent in yeah, any exactly. patent office you know yep. like <laughs> unless yep. maybe it's the patent office of the free republic of pasnia you know but otherwise <laughs> i don't see how this would not get leaked you know so exactly. um, because of course what do you i mean it's so simple i think here it really makes sense in a way and you know Maybe this is the issue with um, <clears throat> being brought up in a culture with computers and video games, but really, you know, seeing it from this point of view, or even let's say it from a Game of Thrones point of view, just basically, you know, not so individualized, try to see the larger picture, right? Try to see it as a system. And then of course you need to, what do you need to control? Innovation. Very simple. You just need to control the patent office. And you tell everyone they have to make money with what they do and the world, it's all a fight and so on and they need to make sure that it's secured great and in this way they gift it to you and this is even official in the us for example i don't know how many thousands of patterns have officially been sequestered by the dod and whoever else and this is not a conspiracy this is official and of course mainly it's energy-based technology yeah energy and medical of course because with whatever tech is available in different <laughs> areas, even with the smartphone and so on, you know, the black mirror, they give you this to control you, but they never give you the medical part and they never give you the energy part because then you're gone, you know, no, and it's, <laughs> or the and communication it's part even, because this is also centralized. Yes. And it, it's funny too, because yeah. you look at, you look at like George Wiseman's Aquacure, like the way he came to that was by the, it's the same sort of thing that he put on his car to impre increase his gas mileage. So like the same thing that's incredible for health, the hydrogen rich water and the brown inhaling the Brown's gas, um, is also, um, you know, like use the same tech and the same methodology to improve the gas mileage in your car. It's like, what the shit? Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it, okay. That's it, cool. Yeah. Because I heard about it for engines. I didn't know that this, I mean, I know that there is certain things you can breathe that are healthy but I didn't know that Brown's gas both has health and yeah. um, this yeah, kind of technical yeah, he applications. Sells, uh, so, yeah. He sells, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, a, it's called an AquaCure machine. Um, and uh, the only thing you have to be worried about with with hydrogen is if it's, apparently if it's over 4%, then it becomes um, flammable. But he has, he's built this, He's he's been an inventor his entire life. He has like six or seven built-in safety features. So like it'll, it's never happened. He's had it out for, you know, de a decade. And people have only had incredible results reversing um many so-called chronic conditions so it's it's pretty incredible um what's what's possible and what's out there um yeah maybe to talk about something practical briefly sure, sure. <laughs> um is you had mentioned you were just uh, and because health is always a great topic and this is always when i'm like you know anybody can have any belief systems they want you know i cherish ultimately all belief systems and they all have the validity however at least those that wish to be 
healthy and have a joyous experience, it really makes sense to look into health, you know, and your own sovereignty and self-responsibility and liberation health-wise. Mm -hmm. So you had mentioned that you were just about to procure or already had gotten a Rife machine. Maybe you want to talk about that because we have one locally and maybe we can talk, you know, for a minute about that. This is sure. uh, quite interesting. Sure. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a donation that will be incoming at some point to the Pasadena Department of Health and Wellness. Um, so I haven't, I haven't had a chance to, to mess around with it yet, but what I have done already is uh, b basically the, the idea behind it. And I'm, I'm sure this is, I'm sure you've come across this too, but, um, you know, we're bioelectric, you know, we're bioelectric beings and just as, you know, harmful EMFs and, and, and such can bring us out of balance, um, frequencies can also bring us back into balance. So the right frequency is a, as a, a I guess it's, yeah, it's a frequency device where I printed out, um. I printed out a, it's like 30 pages of frequencies, like it's just a list of conditions, so-called conditions with the frequency to bring whatever organ system back into balance or to, you know, take care of whatever parasite or whatever, whatever is in question. So, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's basically the, I mean, all that I really know about it so far, I know it's uh, it's a very, very suppressed technology. Um, and uh, there's another, but I printed out another book that I haven't, haven't had a chance to read yet, but, um, but yeah, it's basically just a, a big book on how incredible this, this device is for reversing so-called cancer. Um, so, and obviously like what cancer is, is a, is a story in and of itself, one that I don't really care to get into, but regardless the, the imbalance um, that manifests in the physiological condition that is called that can be reversed by um, by the Rife machine and, and also turkey tail mushrooms which are in the woods and the aqua care machine could probably be a pretty good tool and just fixing deficiencies and um, avoiding toxicity is you're going to be pretty well off if you do those things um, but but yeah hopefully that's a good enough overview that's I mean I, I'm excited to test around with it um, I, I definitely am I'm going to begin it's one of the other one of the other possibilities um, for um, type one for so-called type one diabetes is like pancreatic and liver flukes. They can cause problems with problems in people. So um, I so the whenever hopefully you know it'd be nice to have the Rife machine at the same time, but we'll we'll see if that if that if that comes in by that time. Um, but like the the Aquacare machine plus I've got I ordered a couple um, really good uh, powerful tinctures from Phoenix Aurelius, a, a spagyricist. Um, I don't remember it's Pau de Arco and. Um, like a, a neem, neem uh, I guess a neem oil is it? Um, a neem leaf um, sort of tincture um, that have you know been very historically proven for that. So I'm gonna like I've, I've got the I guess the oxygenation is this is the, the aqua cure part of it, and then um, to assist with the elimination and then the um, the parasite stuff as um, you know taking care of the the parasites. So it's, it's it's I'm gonna try it. I mean it's it's pr it's a pretty prevalent problem. Um, today, so like I, I imagine with all the sh with all with my with my childhood, I, I I would probably presume that at least one of the issues I dealt with was probably caused by parasites. It may still be latent or still be there, or something along those lines. So, um, yeah, right. Even here, of course, uh, to play devil's advocate, I haven't gone to the bottom of this yet. Um, there is even the question because then again, oftentimes we get into this. Oh, now the parasite is my enemy, you know, but actually the parasite might just even if its behavior in some senses may be deemed parasitical, mm -hmm. ultimately still can only be a symbiont because it can only or, or only exists to help in a regulation yeah. where for whatever reason your own body is deregulated. So just saying even the yes, parasite th is not the enemy yeah, that yeah, has thank to you be for, extinguished. Yeah, exactly. Thank you for mentioning that. That's an important important mindset distinction from the West. But go ahead, yeah. Yeah, mindset. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then for the Rife machine, just to mention, we have one that is called a Tesla Lakowski, but it's also basically a Rife machine. It was Georges Lakowski who was playing around with this Tesla, of course, frequency tech. And according to the stories I heard when they started with this, which is also really interesting, is they were all, they were looking for cases like early 20th century, and they almost couldn't find anybody to treat initially supposedly, mm -hmm. you know, because all this civilization degeneration hadn't occurred to that ex to the extent it had now, apparently. And aside from that, the Swiss company is building them in like a new format by Arthur Trenkle, somewhat successful from what I can see. A device does cost, don't want to say something wrong now, but maybe let's say about $8,000 or something. Mm -hmm. But however, even here, many people could say, oh, it's, it's expensive. And I'm like, yeah, well, maybe it's expensive. I don't know their margins or whatever. But if we understand what even one single treatment of chemotherapy costs, mm -hmm. 
yeah. and what it actually does and how many people you could even just potentially slightly improve with a device like this. I'm not claiming it cures anything or anything. This is even so interesting that legally, of course, you're banned from saying these things, you know? Yeah, that's why you're, you're reverse, I mean, reversing, reversing as... so-called conditions. Yep, because they're copyrighted. It's it's fucked up the world we live in. It's their copyrighted disease. So you can get tossed like you yeah. can get tossed in cages for curing their copyrighted disease. But yeah, as many yeah, doctors yeah. have found um, out firsthand, but yeah. <laughs> Yes. And what I can just say is that there have been all kinds of different, you know, minor or also bigger ailments. Um, whereas the device that we have here had been used and people just reported success, you know, some kind of an ache, some kind of something else, and even some things that persisted for some weeks, then they used the device two times and they were fine, you know, and we were all like, yay, you know, and I was also assisting a few people in using it for a few weeks. And even if there was no, let's say, very particular difference or ailment changed at least overall usually the responses were always positive and that people felt energized the only negative feedback i ever got was once from an older lady because she had done the double dose because i was always like you know if you're already here you know let's click the button again go another 15 minutes mm -hmm. you know and it feels really nice with, with this device because you have like a like a piece of I don't know, like this, yeah, which you can hold against your body. Mm -hmm. And the idea is first you put it in the water and then it energizes the water. And then you put it on your, you drink the water and you put it on your body, like here, the lymph nodes and stuff like this. And then you're only not supposed to put it in front of your eyes because supposedly some kind of a protein can crystallize and you're going to be blind. Never happened to anyone mm -hmm. yet, but you know, <laughs> that's the one spot you shouldn't put it. But anyway, and then interesting thing is it feels really warm because supposedly the frequency supposedly is tuned to the mitochondria of your cells, the power plants of your cells to resonate them, you know, provide them with energy. This kind of makes sense because we know that by transferring frequency, just like with two tuning forks, you know, you can transmit information or energy. So this is, you know, not too far-fetched for me. It works through scalar, scalar energy or scalar waves, which I always say are like a, type of waveform behind the standard Newtonian linear propagation waves. So it's almost like an, it's almost immediately everywhere, this type of waveform. And also I've seen some experiments or whatever, where they could show that there is like a field around this device like this. Yeah? But anyhow, so you put it there. And although this thing is just a piece of plastic, your, um, and it itself is not warm, but your skin uh, will get warm. Mm -hmm. because of the resonance, you know, and it feels really nice, you know, and everyone basically felt energized and only this old lady once uh, then said after two doses, yeah, it was a bit too much. She felt a bit overloaded. Okay. But it was an old lady and she did double dose, you know, mm -hmm. but also wasn't anything bad. And anybody else always said, yeah, I feel good. Either I feel energized or I could sleep better or this or that ache went away. Um, so it's really incredible. And the nice thing is here, you just need a bit of energy where next question, of course, maybe we can get it very cheap or free. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You press start, you know, and the thing runs and it can help many people that otherwise would have gone to chemo. So I'm, what I'm just saying here is that not, there's not even comparison in terms of what is the real investment, you know, or what is, um, mm -hmm. yeah, how to allocate the funds because one last sentence <clears throat> in terms of health, for a long time, I didn't understand why in America you have privatized healthcare. And in Europe, generally, the view is, oh my God, you Americans, you're so poor because you have privatized healthcare. And if you, if you have an ailment, you're going to die on the street, basically, you know. Um, but on the other hand, the issue here is healthcare is completely collectivized and socialized, which means you do not need to take the slightest of care about your diet or your lifestyle or anything like that because you know anything in the hospital or whatever will get paid. And also you're never seeing any bills or any, you never know what the hospital actually costs you. You know, you never see the price for a chemotherapy or anything like that in Austria, at least from what I know, or any operation or anything, it's all kept hidden, you know? So basically they use the very bad type of medicine, overcharge you, but they provide it to you for quote unquote free. So everyone keeps using it and is so happy that the state takes care of them. Whilst at the same time, if you 
count it all up, I guess by now at least about 80% of the actual value you're generating is in some way, shape or form siphoned off through taxation, social security payments, uh, and all of these kind of jokes. So yeah, just once again to show what a ridiculous system this is and that it is not built for a human welfare or well-being and hasn't been for at least a hundred years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's that's uh that's, that's definitely true. I mean it's uh <clears throat> it's really I mean I what I've what I've found and obviously I haven't I haven't uh um you know I haven't gotten uh you know back to perfect health, but I'm a thousand times better than what I've ever what I've I feel better than I did when I was sixteen, for example. Um but like it's it's it really um like it really isn't that uh that complicated. I mean you look at the Chinese medicine perspective, it's all about all about balance. Um, and if you, you know, if you get, you get in tune with your body and like, you can, you can, you can still, spl you, like, you can still splurge on things, but like your body will tell you like, if you're, if, if it starts to get out of balance and then you start to pull back and you might, and, 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 and that. So like, um, it's really, you know, about, you know, getting in tune with your body and then just, you know, keeping, keeping things in balance. Not, but not about being a, you know, like a, um, you know, purist about it. Um, you know, you know, we're here to, I think we're, we're. I'm I'm here to have fun with with everything I do. Um, since my time is my own, I do things that I enjoy and I'm driven towards. So, um, but yeah, yeah. Anyway, I guess we we've been going for for uh, you know almost almost a couple hours here. It's been a fantastic conversation, Raphael. Um, I want to give you a chance to talk a little bit more about. Uh, um, so you've got your uh, your website, uh, Kamensky dot at. Um, I guess uh, you got a blog there, and uh, you uh, do some some channeling and things. You want to talk a little bit about that? Right. Yeah. All right. So that's <laughs> another interesting rabbit hole. So um, to finish the story, in 2013, as I had mentioned, I stumbled across Bashar, and the point for me was I had listened to Krishna Murthy, I had seen Zeitgeist, and all these kind of things. <clears throat> uh, and found some some people I like. I had read some French philosophers and so on, mm. which, as we had discussed in our show on Team Rabbit Hole as well, <clears throat> with you, is you know somewhat too heady. And here I kind of found this kind of balancing aspect through this channeled material by Bashar, which again, the past few years, what he's saying in terms of the pandemic and so on, I don't agree with. And there's still a huge question mark for me: what actually is going on there with him? Or what parallel version he's channeling right now because as i had mentioned for many many years he went on about health and so on in a very much self-responsible fashion and basically said that 99.999 percent of disease only occurs basically yeah because of an overload of toxins simply put and lack of oxygenation and all of that mm -hmm. and now he starts talking about masks and all kinds of craziness and the one thing is to honor the belief systems of the questioners but it's very strange that what he has mentioned, you know, for over 30 years somehow is not coming across anymore. It's a very strange situation. Anyhow, but for me, <clears throat> this was the first moment when I was like, oh, there is a source of information that is, at least to me, perfectly consistent and uses a framework that's very basic and universal. And that actually within itself allows for, let's say, a minimally viable matrix of creation that if I assume these basic rules and laws and think them through, I can actually imagine it to be dynamic enough to be able to account for any and all experience. So that was kind of, you know, the basis point from where I started when I did this presentation. And then the same year through, you know, synchronicity, I came across ayahuasca and um, I had already been interested in channeling because I generally do like communicating and presenting and also did different types of presentations for friends and, uh, different capacities but it was still somewhat too linear for me and somewhat too contrived or even just doing the same presentation three times i already got bored um so i already felt this attraction to channeling and ayahuasca basically just helped me this would be you know the bad standard hippie story or something oh you drink ayahuasca once now you think you're enlightened haha -ha, now you think you're a channel um the joke in my case was that there was no you know, alien entity or anything coming to me and telling me, no, you have to channel, you are the big important guy. But it was more like, what is the most effective and choice expression of my desire to creatively communicate that I can find? And um, <clears throat> channeling appeared like a obvious choice, especially because I was so interested in it. And then 
maybe a few months after that, I started channeling. I did plenty of recordings. They are all linked on my website, like old stuff. And then maybe three years ago, I started doing group sessions about once a month locally with, you know, let's say three to 10 participants usually. Um, and the whole idea here or the whole journey here is um, because I am aware that ultimately everything is connected. So on the one hand, you could say, oh, who do you think you are? You, you're claiming some kind of entity is potentially speaking through you. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. This could also just be an elaborate role play, even though I'm not deliberately feigning anything or trying to portray anything in particular. It's a quite intuitive process and I don't really have so much time to contrive anything. That's also the um, almost an exercise for myself and also why I chose it, because I realized I have to go towards some kind of intuitive frontier by engaging in that practice. And that's something I want for myself, for my own balancing, and also something that I just find much more exciting than, for example, you know, spending many hours to prepare a very exact one hour presentation, if you can catch my drift. Yeah? So that's mm -hmm. kind of how it came to be. And also the realization that if I really understand through hermetic law and principle or whatever, that ultimately, I believe this would be the law of mentalism, uh, all is mind, all is consciousness, all is connected, then how could I be so arrogant as to claim that I am not connected to anything, whatever it could be, if we are really connected to everything fundamentally through the, let's say, fabric of consciousness itself, right? That's the other point of view. And then also in my particular case, I'm not doing trans channeling where my consciousness would be out and not remember, but I do conscious channeling, meaning my consciousness is very much aware of what is occurring, could technically censor and steer, which generally I'm trying not to do and just allow it to flow in a sense. There is certainly some conscious agency or a lot of conscious agency in a sense remaining with me. But for me, it's all about this game of, you know, where does my consciousness stop? Where does a higher quote unquote or just different consciousness start? Is there a distinction? Where is it? What is it? So while I had started to channel different archetypes from tarot and different alien archetypes, etheric energy archetypes, eventually, maybe this is how I can round out the story, um, said, because for me, let's say doing predictions or talking about specificities was never so important. It's more about general principle and basically giving those participating ideally a glimpse or a sense of the frequency of self-responsibility and self-empowerment and the information through the verbal communication. So they themselves can hone into that frequency for themselves. And then ideally, let's say, after the first encounter or the first contact with me as nothing else but a reflection of their own energy, become aware that whatever, you know, relaxation, insight, awareness, information they may have gleaned through the channeled interaction with me is actually a capacity and energy contained within themselves and perfectly accessible to themselves in each and every now. Does this make sense? Yep. I'm with you. I'm with you. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, I'm just asking because, you know, this yep. is what happens in the channeling state. Often, you know, you're building these lines and then you have to make full circle. Um, so with that basically being my, my goal, just, just as you, you know, self-liberation and in this case, in the spiritual sense or in a metaphysical sense in all, in all ways, mm -hmm. um, I eventually said, I would like to receive a name just because it's easier for individuals to address it because before it was just the archetype of this or that. And then what I actually got, uh, two weeks later, just when I was about to lay down. I want to say it came from the side, but it was just obvious for me that this was not, or that this was a specific information. And the name that came up was Ringo. I'm not sure what associations you have with uh, Ringo. Uh, first thing that came to mind for me was like, uh, I'm not even really a Beatles fan. Like, what is this, you know? Yeah. But also I was aware enough to recognize I was asking for a name and I knew I'm not going to look up different names. What sounds cool? This is what I'm going to choose. But I knew that if I'm asking like this, I'll just intuitively receive the proper answer, right? So I have to stick with it as well. Mm -hmm. um, 
So first I was confused and a bit like, okay, what is this? And then I found many different correlations. Maybe the most strong one is in that the basic system of numerolo numerology I use is Ringo actually amounts to 36. And in numerology, you always do the additions. So then it's 369. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> and then in vortex mathematics, the 369 creates a triangle which in vortex mathematics, the other figures create a um, infinity sign. Um, so there's just a lot of synchronicities that uh, occurred for me, which basically helped me to accept that name. And so what I'm doing now is I'm channeling Ringo and what Ringo is, is simply a, a representation of all the aspects that my higher self and those present could potentially connect to. So as I'm imagining it in a sense, it's like a very large round table and all the differing entities and aspects, you could even call them aspects of your own personality. It doesn't matter now what kind of framework you would use, but having all of them, including me as Raphael, which is kind of important, sitting at the table and in a sense, all of them contributing uh, according to whatever is required, let's say. Um, yeah, there's a lot more I can say about this, so uh, I'll just leave it there for now. Nice. Well, that's that's definitely a fantastic uh, um, introduction. That's, that's a, um, yeah, I, I dig the story. I dig the story. And um, I will, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, um, scheduling one of these with you. I, I did a, uh, um, with uh, Lindsay Shriver right, from Roadways, yeah. I did a, uh, she did, I guess she calls them soul retrievals, soul, soul retrievals. It was a guidance session is what she calls them. It was, uh, so that, that was interesting. I've done a Vedic astrology, um, reading. I, uh, got a 2022 astrology reading from Ross Ben, um, who I mentioned, uh, mentioned earlier. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm interested, I'm interested in trying a lot of these things out. So, um, we'll, uh, we'll probably be in, in contact about that, but, uh, um, for, before, before I let you go today, it's, yeah, I don't want to keep you too long. I know it's, it's, uh, it's late there. Um, it'd be past my bedtime. I don't really stay up that late anymore. Um, but, uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> um, do you, any, any closing thoughts for the listeners and feel free to pl pl plug anything you'd like. I'll make sure to drop, uh, drop any links in the show notes that you'd like me to. Oh, well, I'd like to thank you for the invitation. Thank you for reaching out. Uh, thank you for finding us through Exertus and uh, <laughs> teamrabbithole.com further up and further in. So really very, thank you very much for reaching out. I'm very happy to collaborate with you as well. We certainly, you know, share the theme of self-liberation, which, you know, at least to me, seems ultimately what this journey kind of is about to, um, allow ourselves to believe for a brief moment in the eyes of the one creator that, you know, we are limited. We are, you know, maybe even slaves of all of this and then discover all, all the systems, all the structures and ultimately pierce through the illusion of those contrived artificially self-limiting perceptions and belief systems. And, uh, yeah. I'm glad that we shared that theme. I'm pretty sure there's many others out there. I'm very sure that there will be many, many more coming to the fore and engaging in these kind of discussions and exploring these kind of themes as ultimately I would consider this is a very individualized journey. There is ultimately no right or wrong answer that applies to each and every one because the main point here being in my point of view, at least is to really be able to discern your own excitement and then really be able to discern your own path. And here I would just reiterate, which is in a sense, my whole stick, you know, is really trust yourself, be very, very honest with yourself, but also trust yourself. And if you sense that just like you had said, when you had stumbled across Team Rabbit Hole podcast, when you said you only listen to things that resonate with you. And the one thing of course is to be like, oh, I don't want to hear it. It's vibing low. I'm ignoring it, you know? Um, that's one thing, but it's another, uh, it's another thing to just be able to discern, you know, just what rings true for you. And maybe one last thing I could mention, mm -hmm. one last useful tool that I always like to apply is when hearing anything, you know, anything is just a proposition of a belief system you can adopt or not. But if in any way, shape or form, anyone is ever commuting, communicating anything to you and you feel that it is limiting. You feel it's off. You feel it's uh, it's feeling bad. And here again, I'm not talking about ignoring something you should transform, but I'm basically talking about um, 
any type of belief or proposition that would make you believe that you are, let's say, more limited than you feel yourself, less capable, less powerful, less divine, less infinite, uh, less joyous or whatever. Uh, and one can always feel that, you know, it feels kind of strange, you know, it's not appropriate. And what I had come to discover is that those negative belief systems, all of them, they are fundamentally always wrong. Just as they say with fear, it's nothing but false evidence appearing real. And anytime one is in those states, one cannot see it, which is, you know, the great illusion of this place that we have built within our own consciousness that we can can actually in a way pretend to really believe it yeah mm -hmm. but ultimately one can always discover that all negative belief systems that are triggering your scarcity response and your fight or flight response your fear of your own existence your fear of your own worthiness they're always wrong and if we have the courage to investigate them we will always discover that they are wrong and this is also how we can liberate ourselves individually and collectively yeah cheers man yep. yeah I, uh, I i appreciate all that well said well said um so uh yeah thanks again for coming on i uh yeah look forward to staying connected in the future and uh and uh, whatever else whatever else transpires but it's been uh, great having a couple chats thus far and uh, i'll certainly be uh be continuing to listen to um, team rabbit hole myself um anything else before i let you go man thank you very very much Cheers. and thanks everyone for listening all right guys and uh there you have it Raphael from team rabbit hole um certainly do appreciate you uh you sticking around hope you definitely hope you enjoyed it it was a really valuable discussion um i know uh, i know i definitely enjoyed it but uh um, i'll leave you with yeah vanupodcast.com for all things vanu uh libertarian type publications for uh, any uh, if you're looking for solutions oriented uh reading material or uh, anarchist agorist fiction um, or uh, I guess we do have uh, ghost pads and uh, ghost phones now if you're looking to step up your security culture uh, in the digital second realm. Because that's really the issue that we're dealing with with these, you know, ghost phones, ghost pads, whatever, is that there's no way that you can organize with, with other people and have these distributed tribes if you have a snitch in your pocket all the time. Mm -hmm. People are literally wearing wires all the time. They have a snitch in their pocket and they're trying to do clandestine things. That's never going to work. You know, I'm focused on this project now because I really see how the unfettered flow of communication is what really has prompted this, you know, shift in consciousness. And that if this does, if this can't continue this way and people can't communicate freely with each other, then all the dis distributed networks that have formed um, aren't going to be very effective and they're not going to, uh, they're not going to be able to do what they could do. Um, if you can't communicate, especially when you're basically part of a dispersed tribe at this point, you can't communicate without being monitored. It basically hamstrings anything, you know, anything going forward. Step up your privacy and order a ghost phone today. Just visit libertyunderattack.com forward slash ghost phone. Again, libertyunderattack.com forward slash ghost phone. And make sure to keep a lookout for more ghost pads, privacy tools, freedom boxes, and more. Libertyunderattack.com is the website. Liberty Under Attack Publications. Share your story. Find your freedom. The second volume in the Brushfire Thriller series takes place in the not-so-distant future. In the second half of the 21st century, the War of Ideas took place. The creation of second realms and individualist decentralized freedom cells spread across geographical regions, and the practical ideas of liberty, voluntary interaction, and peace took hold. 
The Free Society in 2048 is loosely based on Samuel E. Konkin III's Phases of Agorism, in which the destruction of the state would be realistically accomplished through the establishment of pockets of free individuals, black and gray markets, and the spreading of the ideas of freedom and liberty, until the demand for an overarching state was no longer perceived as essential, and individualism and voluntary interaction prevailed. The original creators of the freedom cells who led the world to a better place are still scattered about living their lives, including Maxine, the late Henry Tucker's love, and the now washed up but stubborn punk rocker Warren, still reside in the Appalachian Mountains. Maxine's nephew, Vince, and his boy Tommy, who had been band nomads ever since Tommy's mom left to pursue a materialistic quest for fortune in the never-ending rat race, went to visit Auntie Max on her homestead on Jim Mountain Road. Although Max is very happy for the visit, she has an ulterior motive. Her close friend she met during her revolutionary days, Isaac Hopper, is trapped in a geographical area previously known as New York City, now known as the State Zone. The State Zone is one of only a handful of remnant states where an overarching power-hungry government rules over its citizens with aggressive force. Together, Warren, Vince, and Tommy team up and use their knowledge, including advanced hacking techniques, low-tech ciphers, IRC-encrypted chat, and cryptocurrencies to infiltrate and evade the authorities in the state zone and bring back Isaac to freedom. But their mission, the rescue of Isaac, Auntie Max's close friend and confidant, isn't going to be easy. They are up against a powerful authoritarian Hydra state, a massive surveillance apparatus, a relentless and murderous police state, and a propaganda arm that will not stop until extremist terrorists known as the trio, Warren, Vince, and Tommy, are brought to justice. Will the trio pull off the rescue of Max's longtime friend, Isaac Hopper? Will the forces of good, free individuals, prevail against the safest forces of evil? Find out in the second volume of the Brushfire Thriller series, 2048, available exclusively via Liberty and Attack Publications. Just visit libertyunderattack.com forward slash 2048. Again, libertyunderattack.com forward slash 2048, or snag them both in the Brushfire bundle. libertyunderattack.com forward slash 2048 bundle. Libertyunderattack Publications. Share your story. Find your freedom.